Shipley Wharf on one of the, the earliest sections of the canal to be opened. When the canal was built, it was all done by hand labour, it was sort of excavated just by navvies, as they were called then, navigators, because they worked on the navigation. That you excavated the canal and then, if necessary, it was lined with a clay puddle which kept the water in. The canal was actually built mainly for carrying limestone which might seem a strange sort of thing today, but in the 1770s you'd got the development of the textile industry and people all wanted to have uh, the weaving cottages that we, we know of with the sort of two storeys and to build a, a two-storey house you needed a decent mortar and that's where we used lime for, and then once you'd got the, the, the uh, the weaver's cottage built, it needed to be light inside so it's lime washed. And of course at the same time we'd got uh, lime being used on agricultural land. And so because of that was, there was a tremendous demand for it. At the same time that they wanted a way of getting their uh, textile products over to Liverpool and into the, the market over there for the colonial areas. When, when the canal was built, Shipley wasn't a, a major centre as, as it is today. And it only really developed uh, in the 1850s when a, a cholera epidemic in, in Bradford was attributed to the, uh, to the Bradford Canal and the Bradford Canal was closed. So in order to get all the wool, the raw materials for the, the mills in the area, they had to have new warehouses. And so here, the warehouses we see opposite were initially built in about the 1860s to store wool for the whole of the Bradford area and these warehouses became one of the main centres for storing wool they were extended in the 1880s and 1890s and then the the brick warehouses beyond the bridge were built into the 1930s because the canal was still an important uh, carrier of wool for this area even into that sort of time. Well from Shipley we're now going to go up the valley I mean, the canal follows the contours of the, the sides uh, it's a very simple canal to build but there were one or two more important uh, structures on it, more interesting structures uh, that were more difficult to build and we're going to have a look at one of those now at Dowley Gap. So if we go on up Well, it started to rain a bit, which is never a bad thing for a canal, because uh, you do need the water. But I mean, this, we're actually coming to quite an interesting area where the canal crosses over the River Eyre. And here, over on the left-hand side, in amongst the trees, you can actually still see the quarry where they got the stone for building the aqueduct. And it, it's actually quite an interesting feature geologically. We're on one of the glacial moraines going up the valley, and the glacial moraine is actually over, further over. And here the river has cut through the sandstone. So we've got the river away on our right hand side, just down the valley. And here we've got some of the sandstone, uh, which they were able to use for getting the stone to build the aqueduct. It's got seven arches. Uh, which is quite, quite a big structure really, it's the biggest on the canal and the, but the arches aren't sort of symmetrically placed. We've got two at the far end and they're where the, the river goes through and then there are five dotted around on this end for where the flood water goes through because the river area is a really quick up and down river and so you've got to make sure that when they have these flash floods that you can get all the water away. The whole of the aqueduct is made of stone and the canal section was actually lined with clay originally but that does cause problems with leakage and here it's now been relined with concrete. As we go along the canal today and we're going to carry on going up 
and having a look at some of the other structures, you've got to remember that we're looking at, at the canal with 20th, 20th century eye, eyes when we're used to making sort of really big structures. And they look quite puny to us today, but really they, they were some of the, the biggest engineering works of their time. And here at the end of the aqueduct, we've actually got a, a small mill that quite a few of these little mills grew up al alongside the canal using the canal for transport. And it just shows how important the canal was to the development of industry really all the way along, even in somewhere as sort of rural as here. Well, we're now coming to the Bingley Five Rise locks, which were opened with a great fanfare in 1773. And they're certainly a fine engineering structure. But I always have my doubts a little bit because in 1610, in France, they'd opened an eight rise flight. And so the technology was already well known. Uh, th there are problems with these riser locks. The riser ones are where one lock is actually built right onto the next lock, so that the top gate of one lock is the bottom gate of the next. And the big problem with them is that they use a lot of water every time a, a boat goes in a different direction. So if you're going up this flight of locks, you'd have to have all the locks full of water, all, all the, the top four filled with water. So for each boat going through, you use four locks of water. And that makes them very, very wasteful. Uh, and quite soon after they built the Five Rise, they decided that this sort of system was not the effective way of building a canal. And subsequently, all canals had individual locks with a space in between each flight, each, each lock. I mean, the locks on this canal use about 80,000 gallons. That's 400,000 gallons of water every time a boat goes up and down here. Anyway, we'll, we'll go up and have a look now at the actual locks and the paddle gear for controlling the water and see if we can see any of the sort of smaller engineering details that go to make up the flight. I think one of the nice things about canals is, is they tell a sort of 200 year story and you can just find all sorts of little details like this bit of ironwork here on the side of the lock and that's to actually protect the stonework from the tow lines of boats being towed in and out of the, or out of the lock. The tow line rubbed against the iron rather than into the stonework and you find those all over the place on riser locks. Well, this is one of the lock gates for holding back the water. And these are actually brand new gates. They've only been put in this year. But interestingly, they've still got the original uh, type of paddle gear. That's the, the sluice mechanism for letting the water in and out. And they're, they're called a scissor gear because they operate from side to side and they're pivoted at the bottom and there's a hole at the bottom of the gate to let the water out. There's a boat just about to come up and so they've had to fill all these chambers of the lock so there's going to be enough water for the boat to pass through the whole flight of five. And what happens is that with, once the boat's in the chamber below, they'll have to open this sluice to fill the lock below up and get the, these two locks at a level. You then open the gates The boat will sail into this lock. Shut the paddles because you don't want to waste any water. You then shut the gate. go up and then you open the gate 
the paddle gear above and let that lock full of water down into here to fill it up to the same level. It wasn't until 1816 that it was completed as a through route right from Leeds to Liverpool. It was the longest canal, 127 and a quarter miles, and it also took the longest time to build, 45 years, from the first sod being uh, dug right through to it being opened throughout. It's always been open, it's remained open all its life, but in the 1960s, it became very close to being closed. Fortunately, it wasn't, and so it's still here today for everyone to enjoy.